And what I'd like to do is just to say, Barakata um, Yahweh, Yahweh Bashiem, Yahweh Shai. Now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I've received some um, emails and uh, from some individuals who um, clearly do not fully understand the area when we use the term Edom. Now, Obviously, I've dealt with it in the past, and um, the beauty about what we do is that this is not a sermon. This is a teaching. So unlike a sermon that sometimes an individual feels a little bit acute about going back to, with teachings, you must always go over them. And if we follow the example of Yahawashai, he went over many of his teachings, and you would hear them being repeated sometimes in different contexts or in different situations. Now, the area that obviously we're dealing with is the area of, of who is Esau. It's, a, it's an area that if we don't deal with it and we deal with it correctly, what you'll find is that uh, people will have a very limited mentality when it comes to using the word because most uh, individuals, especially a particular race of individuals, they say that Esau has already been done away with. Now, that's really laughable when I hear that because if Esau has been done away with it, why is it that Esau is ruling the world and running up and down the, uh, every street of every country? So it's impossible that Edom, the nation, the bloodline has been done away with. They, they have not. And whilst I'm out there touching that point, let's make something absolutely unequivocally clear. There is no such thing as a black Hebrew. There is no such thing. And remember, you have to correct people when they say that. And some of us, unfortunately when we're having these dialogues, we're not correcting people on the spot. You should not let anyone leave your presence without correcting them because to say that there is such a thing as a black Hebrew then gives credence to the idea that there's such a thing as a so-called white Hebrew or so-called Chinese Hebrew or so-called um, Germanic um, Hebrew. That's not it. Uh, a Hebrew is a Hebrew. Uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a nationality and it is a race of people. And they only come one way. Now, granted, however, we live in a day and age, according to James chapter 1 and 1, where it speaks about James giving salutatories to the churches that have been scattered abroad. Because even in Yahweh's time, his own brother, James, knew that there were others like him, but they were scattered throughout the four corners of the world. Now, bear this in mind. In his day, there was only what was called three parts of the world. And those three parts were uh, Asia, Europe, and what we call today Africa. Those were the three parts of the world. But the fourth part was yet to come. And the fourth part is what we call today the Americas, from South America to Central America to North America. All of those land masses are the fourth part of the world. Hence why the scripture says, he will scatter you to the four parts or four corners of the world. That's what it's signifying. Now, with that in mind, let us begin to go into the teaching now of who is Esau. Now, remember, I've, I've, for those of you who have been with me a while, you know I've taught on it in different aspects and I've drawn different things, and hopefully today I'll pull more from the Scripture to allow you to get an even greater understanding. So let's go, if you please, to the book of Philippians chapter 3 and verse 5. Let's just go there really quick so that we can 
uh, draw some context to what we're speaking about. Again, that is Philippians chapter 3 and verse 5. And when you have it, officer, do go ahead and read. Philippians chapter 3, verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. All right. So notice what it says. It uses the term circumcised the eighth day. So that's a, within our ancestral tradition, that's a practice that all the men child were circumcised on the eighth day. Uh, again, that's not the teaching, so we're not going to go into breaking that down. But then it says, of the stock of Israel. Now, when it uses the word stock of Israel, that ties in with Numbers chapter 1 and 18. All right? Just very quickly, officer, hold where you are in Philippians chapter 3. Run, if you please. I'm not even going to turn there, but you go to Numbers chapter 1 and 18. Let's read what it says there, and then we'll come back to here. Book of Numbers chapter 1, verse 18 and they assembled all the congregation together on the first day of the second month, and they, de- they declared their pedigree after their families by the house of their fathers according to the number of the names from 20 years old upward by their poles. So you'll notice that it speaks about that it's dealing with the pedigree after the house of their fathers, not the mothers. Now, that lets you know right away. That's a quick clue to let you know who is Hebrew and who is Esau. All right. Because Esau always includes the mother in the bloodline. It always includes the women in the bloodline. They do. They say that if if your mother's a Jew, then you are also a Jew, which is unscriptural. There's no seed in the woman. Uh, oh, they like to take the text from the book of Genesis that says, that says the seed of the woman. But again, that's because of their limited uh, understanding what, why they've completely um, made a mess of that. But a woman does not have seed. In other words, uh, uh, it's a man. The word seed comes from dealing with the word generation. So a woman doesn't have that. A man has that. So it lets us know here when it's back in the book of Philippians, chapter 3 and 5, it said, of the stock of Israel, of the bloodline of Israel. Then it says, of the tribe of Benjamin. So now it's breaking it down to a specific tribe. Now, the Khazarian, the Jewish person, can never do that. You ask a Jewish person, okay, what tribe are you are? They can't tell you because they don't know. Because they were never taught it, it's never been passed down, and they have no clue because they are not of the stock of Israel. Because again, they use this waffling term that they are my mother or my father and all of that. It doesn't, doesn't work to be proved that already in Numbers. But then what it says of the tribe of Benjamin being specific, now this is Paul now, and then it says a Hebrew of Hebrews. Now, you have to ask yourself the question, why does he say that? What's the purpose behind it? Well, the purpose behind it is quite simple. Because going back to the time of uh, of Jacob and Esau, their father, Isaac, they both came from the same father. Stay with me. So, if we go back even further to the time of Abraham, Abraham was considered to be a Hebrew. But remember, Ishmael, his first son, is also Hebrew. Follow me closely now, because remember, the father teaches the son all of the rudiments and the the traditions of the family. So Abraham, brother Abraham, taught Ishmael how to be a Hebrew. So when, when he left, even though, remember, Ishmael's mother was a black Egyptian woman, and Abraham 
was a black Hebrew man, here they produce a child who is Ishmael, where the Ishmaelites come from, where indeed the Arab race comes from. And one would say, well, hold on a moment. How can the Arabs don't look black today? Well, they're not black because, again, they, just like the Egyptians, they are, they are the byproduct of the, uh, of the Turkish war in terms of all of the mixing that took place. That's why you find the Egyptians, because it goes back to, to, to the war that, that they had back in the time with the Turks. The Turks turned them just the same way as they turn those so-called Arabs. And, and most of them are not even real Arabs. They're Turkish. But anyway, let's not go down that road. So here we are now looking at how the color has changed. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm touching color, but I'm not going to be specific on color because I'm going to show you something later on. But the key that we have to understand with all of this is this, that Ishmael was a Hebrew. So he was basically an Arab Hebrew. But now let's, let, let's jump ahead. We're now with, with, with Isaac or Isaac, laughter, and let's deal with his children, Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau now has come along. Here we have Jacob, who is a black man, according to the scriptures, makes it very clear. And then we have Esau, who is a red man. And Esau now is also a Hebrew. You follow? But he is Hebrew Edomite. Whereas Jacob is Hebrew Hebrew. Okay. That may be confusing you just a little bit. Because remember, the 12 tribes come out of Jacob. Now, when we're back now to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 5, it says a Hebrew of Hebrews, meaning he is not what you call an Ishmaelite um, uh, Hebrew, is not what you'd call an Edomite Hebrew. He is a Hebrew Hebrew because he's of the stock of Israel of the 12 tribes. So I hope that was quite clear, and I hope it, it has helped people to understand the context now. Because as you read the scriptures down the road, it will help you to correlate who is whom according to the scriptures. Now, moving on from there now, we must also look at another point. Um, it says that touching the law, meaning that he abided by the law. Now, the law given him the, the guidance as how to live as a proper Hebrew man. And he says a Pharisee. Now, we won't touch it either because that would lead us in another direction. But that, that meant that it was of a particular sect because there was the Pharisees and there were the Sadducees. There was also during those times the Herodians. But that, all that is a different teaching. But getting back to the point, then we have to look at this factor. The Holy Spirit is only dealing with Israel. Now, again, you'll hear it in the so-called Christian church. The Holy Spirit is dealing with everyone impossible impossible it, it, it's just clearly not but let's let's prove everything because we, we have to make sure that we use the scriptures let's go to book of first john chapter 5 and when we get there we're going to read verse 19 first john chapter 5 and then we're going to read verse 19 all right now when we're there the, the script that, that I, I want you to read. All right, let, let's we'll go ahead and read that first, and then we'll, we'll go on. Look at first John, fact, chapter give me a favor, five. Give, give me a favor. Begin at eighteen, if you please, to give more clarity to those who are not familiar with this text. Uh, book of First John, chapter five, verse eighteen. We know that whosoever is born of Yahweh sinneth not, but he that begotten of Yahweh keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Verse 19. Now, notice what it says. It says that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Why is it that you sin not? Because if you keep his laws, statutes, and commandments, you don't sin. You don't sin. If you keep his laws, you don't sin. Now, anything outside of the law, right, is, is, what, you, is, is what you do. But the laws, if you don't keep them, you are in sin. 
Watch this. Then it goes on to say, it says, um, and that the wicked one toucheth him not. Now, you need to under, underline the word, that wicked one. So we're going to establish who is that wicked one. All right, read on, please, officer. Verse 19. And we know that we are of Yahweh, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And so there it is right there, making it again very clear. We are of Yahweh. We are of the Father. The Scripture tells us that. And the whole world is, is found, founded upon the wickedness of men. Again, which man? Which men? We're going to explore that. Go with me now to Job chapter 9 and 24. Let's establish who that is. Job chapter 9 and 24. We've used it many times, so you should be quite familiar with that. All right, go ahead. Book of, the book of Job chapter 9, verse 24. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? So it lets us know very clearly there that the earth is given into the hands of the wicked. Again, who is that wicked one? He covereth the faces of the judges, meaning all of the identity of those that were in the scriptures, he has covered them. You see, back in the days when many of the, the, the patriarchs and the prophets wrote scriptures, there were some artists that were in existence in those days who drew the likeness of the judges on their books. Just the same way today, if you go to a bookstore and you pull a book off the shelf, it has a picture sometimes at the front or at the back or highlighting the, the whole cover of the author of the book. And that's no different today than how it was back in the times of antiquity. They did it in those days because it was a means of identifying as to who was the writer of such. All right, so we see then, it, it says that they covered their faces, because what the wicked did, what these particular people did, they went in, saw the identity of who the, the prophets were, and they changed the image of them. They changed the color of them. From them being men of color, they changed it to being more men that look like them. Interesting. And then it, it goes on to say, the face of the judges, if not, where and who is he? Well, we'll get to that in just a moment. But first, if you please, let, we'll, we'll come back to, to uh, Job in just a moment. Let's move from here and go to Proverbs 24 and 2. Proverbs 24 and 2. Watch this now. Mm -hmm. Book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verse 2. For their hearts studyeth destruction, and their lips talk of mischief. So you see what it says there? This is the nature. Now, we're, I'm, I'm building to who the person is, but I, I'm showing you right now the nature. For their hearts, it makes it very clear here. And read it again, officer. Read it. Book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verse 2. For their, their heart studieth destruction, and their lips talk of mischief. This is what they have been made to do. They were actually made to do this. It's in their nature to study destruction and to talk about mischief. Mischief meaning plotting and planning and conniving. And then they should to do that. All right, let's go to Second Peter chapter three and thirteen. The Bible speaks of a new heaven and a new earth. Let's take a look at that. First Peter, I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter three and thirteen. Book of Second Peter chapter three verse thirteen. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. So even though we're here right now and everything seems to be wicked, 
Everything seems to be destructive. One scripture says, be in the world, but not of the world. And another scripture says, be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed from this world. Now, even though we're living in wickedness, we're living in Babylon right now, whether you're listening to this over in Europe or, or here in the Americas, the fact is, we're living in Babylon, because wherever you are is, is really Babylon. It's just that America is the Babylon. And so when we, when we see this now, we have a hope, a blessed hope that we cherish not in vain, that uh, we're looking according to the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. Now, when we use the word new, you'll find that word uh, repeat itself a number of times in the book of Revelation. Wherever you see the word new, it always means to refresh. So the earth is going to be completely refreshed, remade over. And when we say remade over, we're not talking about tearing apart and putting it all back together. Okay? It means to be refreshed. In other words, the destructive element is going to be completely and totally destroyed. And everything that's in the air will be completely viscerated so that even the air will, will smell different. And the clouds will be of such that the brightness of the clouds will have a different illumination. So it will, it will, in fact, look like a new earth and a new heaven. Why a new heaven? Because when we look out from the earth, we will see the heavens more clearly. Oh, my goodness. But, but, but let, let's not get carried away with that just yet. So from here, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 24 and 6. Watch this. All right. Ezekiel 24 and verse 6. Okay. <clears throat> I'm a little slow this evening, Pastor. That's all right. Just, 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 just grunt every now and then so I know you're out there. <laughs> The book of Ezekiel, chapter 24, and verse 6. All right. Wherefore, thus saith the Most High Yahweh, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is therein, and whose scum is not gone out of it. Bring it out piece by piece. Let no lot fall upon it. Now, here is a scripture that most people don't even realize exists because the scripture is actually saying that a particular race of people is scum. <laughs> you see, if I told you that before we got to it, then you'd be wondering, what book is he reading from? Well, you've read it for yourself. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Woe unto the bloody city. What city is that? The city that kills the innocent. Which innocent? Those that are called by his name. Innocent blood. It's a bloody city because that's all it, 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 it revels in. Crime, murder, and those who are meant to be the protectors, shooting and killing innocent people. But then what's what it goes on to say? To the pot whose scum is therein and whose scum is not gone out. In other words, they made such a mess, they continue to make a mess, and, and because of what they are, they make a mess of everything. Scum, because that's what scum does. It spreads itself. It's like having a greasy, a greasy pot. The more you wash it, the worse it seems to get, unless you have the right detergent to get rid of it. That's what this particular group of people are. Scum. <laughs> You've read it for yourself, and I, and I would certainly advise you, underline it, mark it, highlight it, because it's in the Bible. And then it goes to say, whose scum is not going to of it. Bring it out, piece by piece. In other words, dismantle them, get them out, whichever way you've got to do it, but get them out so that they don't fall or make a continual mess further. From now, let's go to uh, Malachi chapter 1 and verse 4. All right. Malachi chapter 1 
and verse 4. Book of Malachi, chapter 1, verse 4. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will, we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Most High of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Most High hath indignation forever. So notice what it says. I'm going to jump up further, and I'm going to, and I'm going to begin at verse um, I'm going to begin at verse 2, so that for those who have not had this teaching before, you can now get who the cliffhanger and who is the scum, who is the wicked, who is that conniving one. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 2 says, I, I, I have loved you, says the Most High, yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau... Jacob's brother, says the Lord, yet I loved Jacob. Verse 3. And I hated Esau. So that lets you know the brother who came out uh, of the womb with a reddish complexion. And you know them today because they're the individuals that can't stay out in the sun. They're the individuals who get embarrassed and they start to turn red. They're the individuals that um, have, have, have what they call freckles on their faces, ginger hair. Hello. So now it's letting you know who is that individual. And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage, all those things that belong to him, and said, I've laid them waste. For the dragons. Now, when it uses the word dragons here, that's a reference to a particular time and dispensation. It's what they call the Dark Ages. In history, they have used this term many, many times. Coming up in school, it's a term they used to use a lot. And I used to ask the question, what do you mean by Dark Ages? Well, their excuse was, remember, this is Esau teaching Jake. Um, which is, um, well, first of all, what you've got to understand, it was a time when knowledge was not increasing. Everything was, 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 was regressing. That's not what it meant. Absolutely not. According to the history books, the Dark Ages is called dark because the people who were ruling the, the earth at the time, or Europe to be more focused upon, they were dark people. They were brown-skinned people. They're what today they call black people. Most of Europe remained in so-called black rulership right up until the First World War. A lot of people don't know that. They think when the First World, First World War took place, the majority of the world was still was, was now being controlled by those who we call Caucasian or those we call Edom or Esau. Well, not true. If you look at any of the censors in Europe before the First World War, you will see that Germany still had a great occupant of people who were of dark color. Much of what was going on in Germany was to remove them. Well, anyway, let's not get involved in that right now. But the key that I want you to, to isolate is the fact that when it uses the word dragon, it's speaking about a particular age, a particular time. But then when we jump down uh, to verse 4, it says, Where has Edom said, we are impoverished, but we will return. That re word return deals with what's known as rebirth. That rebirth is the Renaissance period. This is the period when the Europeans now move into what, what they called or, or, or close or, or, or what they call the Middle Ages. And so then when you read on, it, it says, um, and build the desolate places, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the borders of wickedness. Who is the border of wickedness? Esau is the border of wickedness. And the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. The word indignation here deals with um, anger, deals with um, a, 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 a despising heart. 
um, somewhat something that is uh, spoiled. And so the indignation that the Most High has for these people, he says he has it forever. Now, let's go back to Job. Let's go to Job chapter 14 and 4. Let's build the case even further. Remember, we're dealing with who is Esau. Okay? Job chapter 14. Book of Job. Book of Job chapter 14, verse 4. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean, not one? So it says what? Read it one more time. Job chapter 14, verse 4. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean, not one? So he's saying that who can bring something that is clean out of something that is unclean? Nobody can do that. Because what he's trying to let you know right there and then is that something that has been made a certain way, it has been made that way on purpose. So please now, ladies and gentlemen, understand that the nation that is called Edom was made that way on purpose. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. Seeing this day are what? Determine the numbers of the months and are with thee thou hast appointed a bound that he cannot pass. He has boundaries that he cannot go beyond. The Most High has set him so that he can do what he has been hired to do. That's made clear in verse 6. Read verse 6 for me, please, officer. Verse 6. <clears throat> Turn from him that he may rest till he shall accomplish as hiring his day and hiring his so, day. So he has been made to do these things. His boundaries have been set. That's why he has to carry out the thing that he was made to do. He has no choice in the matter. Remember, the scripture says, who can bring a, thing, a clean thing out, I'm sorry, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one can do that. So the Most High, when he made something, he makes it to carry out his will. It's his will that he wants it to carry out. Let's go from there, if you please to Job chapter 9 and 24. Let's run down there so that we can begin to break this down a little bit more. Book of Job chapter 9 verse 24. The earth right, is given... I'm sorry? Go ahead. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? If not, where and who is he? So now then... Let's go to the book of 1 Maccabees, chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 1. The book of 1 Maccabees, chapter 1, and verse 1. From the Apocrypha, book of 1 Maccabees, chapter 1, verse 1. And it happened after that Alexander, son of Philip, the Macedonian, who came out of the land of Chit Chitamen, Chitin, yeah, had smitten Darius, king of the Persians and Medes, that he reigned in his stead, the first over Greece. So here we have the beginning of what is called white power. It began in 323 B.C., but that's when it began. It was during the time of Alexander the Greek, who was the son of Philip the Macedonian, who came out of the land of Chittim and had smitten Darius, the Persian king, and the Medes, and he reigned in his stead. And he was the first Grecian to reign over the entire earth as it was then, because he conquered Asia, Europe, and Africa. He conquered those three areas. So he reigned over them. Then when we go further, read on if you please, verse 2 and, and 3. Verse 2, excuse me. Verse 2, and made many wars <clears throat> and won many strongholds and slew the kings of the earth. Verse 3, 
and went through to the ends of the earth and took spoils of many nations, insomuch that the earth was quiet before him, whereupon he was exalted, and his heart was lifted up. So what, what we find here is this, that this Macedonian, who came out of the land of Chittim, and by the way, for those of you who are trying to work out what land today is Chittim, it's Rome. The Italians, it was Rome. And so what we have here is that they conquered the earth and subdued it. But something extraordinary starts to happen here because of their rule. Let's go to verse 9. In First fact, Maccabees. Um, I'm sorry, but begin at verse 7 so we can get more clarity. First Maccabees, chapter 1, verse 7. So Alexander reigned 12 years and then died, and his servants bear rule every one of his, everyone <clears throat> in his place. And after his death, they all put crowns upon themselves. So did their sons after them many years, and evils were multiplied in the earth. And so, notice what it tells you, is that that's when wickedness start to come about during Alexander's exit. Now, he was the first wicked individual. Now, notice, the history books don't tell you that Alexander uh, the Greek was, was a wicked man. Well, he was. He was a homosexual. Uh, he was an incestual because he had sex with his own mother. Um, the history book tries to paint a pretty picture of all of that. But this was a man, he was an abomination. And so, whilst the history books are, are glorifying him, and everyone's jumping up and down, saying, Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great. He, we, he weren't great. You can't be great in wickedness. And that, that's not something that you, you, we, we should be applauded. He was a wicked man. Yes, he, he was a conqueror, and he did what all conquerors do. But he had some habits that followed through and have, consisted, and have consistently persisted even into this age, this bisexuality this ancestral um, mindset. It has continued because powerful nations make something that is evil okay. That's why living in America today, it has made homosexuality okay. Once upon a time, if you went back to the 60s, um, the day said that homosexuality was a mental disease. How has the mental disease changed from the 60s now we're living in the 2000s, mental diseased individuals now can go around and marry each other and walk around like it's okay. It shows you just how wicked mankind is. And so when we read that, we begin to see another aspect. Um, and from there, go to Second Ezra chapter 6 and 8. Second Ezra chapter 6 and verse 8. <coughs> For the second Ezra, chapter 6, verse 8. And he said unto me, From Abraham unto Isaac, when Jacob and Esau were born of him, Jacob's hand held first the heel of Esau. So what that's letting you know right there is that there's going to be an act that has been done that's going to be fulfilled in prophecy. The holding of his heel, meaning that Jacob, which is us, we are going to have control or power or authority again. This that you see there is showing this is the speaking of the, of the prophecy of it. And then when we go to verse 9, it says, For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. So our time is coming up. Next. All right. Because I want, I want to move us along because I'm taking you to, to a particular point. I want you to go to Isaiah 45 and 7. Because we need to understand some of the, the terms that the scripture uses. And I don't want us to use it kind of loosely without knowing exactly what it really refers to. Isaiah 45 and 7. The book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Most High, do all these things. Now, when it is used in that term, I form the light, the light here 
is referring to Israel. Israel is the light. I form the light, Israel. Now we know he's also speaking about natural light. We know this. But it's also speaking symbolically of Israel, who is the, going to be the light of the world, because they're going to be the next rulers. Then it said, and I create darkness. Who are the darkness? The darkness are the ones who right now have plundered the world into wickedness, because that's what they were made to do. The, the same darkness were used to do something as, as well, to scourge Israel. And this is why when people turn around and, 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 and say, um, um, well, well, you're black, those words black that was given to Israel was used to demonize a particular group of people. So when somebody calls you black, you think of all of the, the negativity that goes with it. But that's why when, when, when people look at um, a, a so-called um, um, a black person, they, they don't see anything good. Why should they? Oh, it's a black day in the city. Black Wall Street. Oh, um, a black comedy. Oh, he has a black heart. Because it's meant to give all of the things that demonizes and makes something look worse than what it is. And that's why the term, the coin, the term now, white people has become prevalent. Because in the Mormon church, they use that a lot. Because white is meant to be beautiful, sinless, spotless, wonderful, oozing through the clouds. That's what it's meant to represent. So when you see someone white, this is what's in your head. Something nice, beautiful, oozing through the clouds. When you see someone black, oh, Get away, stay back, cross over the road, because this is how society has trained. And that's why the Most High, when we read the scripture, it's letting you know, I form the light. Who is the light? Israel. But are they going to tell you that? No, I think not. And I create darkness. Who is the darkness? The very people who call themselves white. Isn't it amazing? The people who are black are the people of life, and the people who are white are the people... Oh, let me leave that alone, okay? It said, I make peace, I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Let's go. Isaiah uh, 25 and 6. Isaiah 25 and 6. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verse 6. And in this mountain shall the Most High of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine and lees, of, of fat things from, <coughs> excuse me, full of marrow and wines on the lees well refined. So here it's telling us that we are going to be in a time of rulership. So here it says, and in the mountain, mountain always speaks about God's government, Yahweh's government, shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things. The word fat here meaning plenty. So when we see the word fat, it's not necessarily speaking about fat, like a fat substance. It just means moorish abundance and, and then it says a fat thing a feast of wines and leeks and the fat things full of marrow uh, and, and so on and so on but then in verse 7 watch what it says and he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. So he, what he's saying is that he's going to set up a ruling class, and the ruling class is going to be Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, for those of you that are of Hispanic descent and you still want to be Edom and you still want, want the long flowing hair and all of those things and you still want to have their color, that's okay, you'll be destroyed. 
plain and simple. If you love Edom that much, then go along and taste their faith. But what this scripture is teaching you, he's going to bring you back to who you were originally. You are going to be as he is. That's why the scripture says, it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Meaning, when he steps out of his chariot, as he, as he cracks the cloud and comes through, that the portal, and he moves into this dimension, when he comes, the world will see him, and they will see that the so-called Caesar Borgia, or um, what's his name, um, uh, Christos, um, uh, 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 I think it's Sapras, when the world sees what he looks like, they're going to see that he is indeed a black man, and they will wail. That's what it says in the book of Revelation. Why will they wail? Because they'll realize everything that they had done was wrong, and they will begin to feel sorrow, but it will be too late because the scripture says he's going to destroy them. Now, people turn around and say, but he's a loving God. He won't do anything like that. Behave. It's like a sentence that has been passed. Do you think, because now that he's, he's appeared and you're going to be crying, that he's now going to spare you? No, you're still going to be destroyed. It's like when, when, when someone gets caught in a crime. They then turn around and say that they're sorry. But they're only sorry because they got caught. Because if they were really sorry, they would have stopped doing what they were, were doing and they would have repented. You got caught, mister. That's why you're sorry. And trust me, you'll be very sorry. You'll be more than sorry when Yahweh Shai appears. And those who don't look like him will look like him. Amen to the Most High God. And those who have been called black bastards and called all those terrible terms, niggers, and all of those, and spinks, and all of those, uh, and wetbacks, and all of those things, all the people who run their mouth on you, all those individuals will suffer the consequence of his wrath. And there's no escaping it, according to the scriptures. It makes it very, very clear. All right. Um, let me we'll get, get carried away then. Let, let's move on. I want you to go, if you please, to a particular scripture. Let's go to Levi, the book of um, Leviticus chapter 17 and 10. Leviticus chapter 17 and 10. Book of Leviticus chapter 17 verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among them that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. Now, the reason why it's important, we're going to read a little bit more in a moment, officer, but I want you to jump back to show you uh, a behavior pattern. This is how we, we know certain groups of people are not of uh, Israel, because there are certain Hamites who love to drink blood. They will cut a goat at a particular part of its body, and let the, the blood drip into a cup, and they'll drink blood. There are Hamites who do that. But Esau is different. Because Esau, he loves to have bloodied flesh. Let's prove it. Go to Genesis 25 and 30. We'll come back to Le Leviticus in just a moment. Genesis, Genesis 25 and 30. And 13 or 30? 30, 3 zero. Okay. Book of Genesis, chapter um, 25 and 30. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red porridge, for I am faint. Therefore, his name called Edom. Now, a couple of things you've got to notice here, and maybe you've missed it in the past, but let's, let's examine it very briefly now. Here it tells you that Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, 
with that red pottage. Really, the reason why the scripture says it was red pottage is, is because it wasn't supposed to be red. It was being cooked down. But the reason why the scriptures had penned it as red is because when you have meat and vegetables and lentils in a pot and, with, and, and it's been cooked, oftentimes the meat is still red. It hasn't cooked out properly yet. And the, the lentils haven't yet cooked itself into the meat. So Esau went along, saw the meat still red, desired to eat it like that. What does that show you? First of all, it shows you Esau has no patience. He couldn't wait for it to be cooked. He can't wait for something to come in its own time. He has to force the hand, give it to me now. It's the same thing that he does throughout the world. I'm not going to negotiate. I'm coming in. I'm taking what I want. This is Esau's mentality. So he, he, says, he said, I pray thee, give me some of that red pottage. For I am faint. Wherefore was his name called Edom. Because the word Edom deals primarily with red. Now the, the word Esau, on the other hand, it deals with more the fact that Isashua, he is wasted away, meaning he has no pigment. He has no pigmentation. And so when we read this, we're beginning to get an idea of the type of characteristics that Edom is. He's impatient. He wants things in his own time. And he's willing to risk nothing to get it, or anything to get it. Because what did he risk? Verse 31, and Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. Now, here's the thing you've got to look at, ladies and gentlemen. Esau had the birthright to the kingdom. Esau had a heavenly right with the father. But to show you his nature, he couldn't care less about it because he was willing to trade it to get whatever he needed to get now. And Jacob very smartly and wisely and cunningly conned it out of him, so to speak. And when he got the birthright, and Esau said, Behold, I am at the point of death, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? So he swore to his brother and gave it to him. That's how Jacob now inherited that which was Esau. But remember, the war between these two brothers didn't begin outside of the womb. They were fighting in the womb. That's why to this very day, there is always this fight between so-called Caucasian and so-called brown people. And the reason why I use the word brown people, because Hispanic people are brown people. And there's been a fight against them for, for centuries. But they're a different shade. So you're finding that the nature of one is fighting against the other and always has been the case throughout the globe. So then we'll, we'll, we'll go back now. Let's go back to, to the script that you were reading. Because Leviticus chapter 17 and 10. And we're going to read from there to verse uh, 12. So read 10 first, then read 11, and I'll explain, and then, then uh, I'll indicate you to read 12. We're going to stop at 12. Go ahead and read, please. Book of Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that so sojourn among them, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even <clears throat> set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. Verse so you 11. mustn't eat blood. You are not to eat blood. He said, I will cut you off. And if you're an Israelite and you drink blood, he says, I'm going to cut you off that you will die and there will be no remedy of you. Read verse 11. Verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, 
and I, I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So you see, it's the blood that acts as an atonement to the soul. So when you have individuals drinking the blood, the warm blood that comes out of the animal, you, that person has made themselves um, an infidel. You've defiled yourself. And, and the Most High God said, that is not what I want. I don't want you to be swallowing down blood. A, a scripture just jumped in my head. Uh, hold this. Uh, run to uh, Numbers chapter uh, 35 and 33, I think it is. Numbers uh, 35 and, uh, and 33. Just uh, real quick. Book of Numbers, chapter 35, verse 33. Oh, yes, ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are, for blood it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. So, you see, it's letting us know, and, and thank, uh, thank you, Father, for dropping it into my head. That scripture is letting you know that when a land has been taken by blood, the blood of the individual who spilt the blood, his blood now, or his descendant's blood, must be spilt back on the land to cleanse it. Wow, that, that's powerful. Now you'll understand why the scripture says, who is he who comes from Edom in dyed garments in blood? And, 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 and something called another, uh, press it or stand this um, uh, through the wine press. In other words, Yahawashai, he's the one that's going to go and slaughter the nation that slaughtered our ancestors. He is. He says this, I alone will do it. That's what it says in the book. I alone will do it. I alone, meaning he and his, and his angels. He's going to spill the blood of Edom back on over all the earth to cleanse it. Because our blood has been spilt in the nations where we have been scattered in order for them to take the land from us. That's powerful. I'm going to read it one more time. So you shall not pollute the land wherein you are. The blood of it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. And that's why, uh, yes, quickly run to Revelation chapter 13 and 10. We're going to come back to Levi, but, but let, let, let's, let's clarify even more, because I want to make sure that the listeners are, are, are getting a, a scripture to back it up. So Revelation chapter um, 13 and 10. Book of Revelations, Revelations chapter 13, verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith, faith of the saints. All right, you see that? He said that ye that leadeth into captivity must go into captivity. If you let some people into captivity, you've got to go into captivity. If you killed with a sword, you're going to have to be killed with a sword. Now, some people say, no, a loving God, he won't do that. It's funny how he becomes a loving God when it's your turn. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, it, it was okay before when we were doing it. Klux Klux Klan and crosses burning and, and, and shooting and hanging and castrating and all of those things. It's okay when, when you were doing it then, but now your turn has come. Hallelujah. Oh, he's a loving God. He, he forgives and he forgets. Uh-uh, not our father. <laughs> he don't forget. Because if we don't forget, sure enough, he's not going to forget. Because he, he says that because you spilt with blood, your blood is going to have to be spilt too. All right, let's go back to Le 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 Leviticus. Le Le let's, let's, get, let's get that out. Because I'm, no, no, not Leviticus. Um, uh, you know what, what I want. Yeah, so Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 17. 17, yeah, because we read 11, let's read 12. Leviticus 17, chapter 12. 17, verse 12. Then I said unto the children of Israel, 
No soul of you, sh- of you shall eat blood. Neither shall any stranger that sojourn among you eat blood. There it is. Makes it very clear. We don't eat blood. That's why when we cook our meats, we cook all the blood out of it. Mm-hmm. All right. From here, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 3. Easy one to remember. 3 and 3. Book of Ezekiel, chapter 3, verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy thy bowels with the roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Honey for sweetness. Read on. Verse 4. And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. So the words that we now speak, in fact, the scripture says, for thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. This is who we're going to. And that's why the words here that uh, the book says that Ezekiel had to eat, he had to be full of the word in order to speak out to all of the nations to which he was sent. Let's go from there quickly, Deuteronomy 22 and 5. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. The woman shall not, the woman shall not, shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Most High thy Yahweh. Now, when people turn around to you and say, well, you know, um, we don't have to follow the laws and all of that, but watch this. That law that the officer has just read, it's not in the Ten Commandments. It's not in the Ten Commandments. Yet it is a commandment. Now, people will turn around and say, well, well, how can that be? How, how, How does it work out? Well, because the 613 commandments are wrapped into the Ten Commandments. They're all tied in because six of them uh, are are pursuant to men, and and the rest is pursuant to the Most High God. All right, because of time, I I, I, I won't elucidate too much on that. From here, let's quickly go to Isaiah 22 and 10. Isaiah 22 and 10. Book of Isaiah, chapter 22, verse 10. And ye have numbered the houses of Jerusalem, and the houses have ye broken down to fortify the wall. Read it one more time. And ye have numbered the houses of Jerusalem, and the houses have ye broken down to fortify the wall. To fortify the wall. Read on. Verse 11. Ye made also a ditch between the two walls for the water of the old pool, but ye have not looked unto the maker thereof, neither had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. So, so there has to be a divide to separate us. We no longer in the future are going to be a mingled race. We're going to be a separate. That's not me. That's not me. That's the book. I'm, I'm sorry I'm speeding you along a little bit. It's just I want to make sure I get these scriptures out so that you have them to re- refer to later. Let's go to First John chapter 3 and 12. Let's deal with the wicked one. First John chapter 3 and verse 12. Book, book of First John chapter 3, verse 12. Not as Cain, who was that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew him, because his own, were, own works were evil and his brother's white righteous. So we, we see then that the scriptures making it very clear that there is this notice we mentioned we've been focusing on Esau. But remember, the spirit of Cain is the same spirit that rested upon Esau. That's why when we read verse 13, he says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Why? Because Cain hated his brother. 
Esau hated his brother. And that's why you can always tell who are those that are of the Most High because they are living in the fulfillment of the scriptures. They're the ones that are being pursued. They're the ones that are being, being set upon. All right, from here, uh, let's go, if you please, to Jeremiah 49 and 10. Book of Jeremiah, chapter 49, verse 10. But I'm, I have made Esau bear. I have uncovered I his bear. <clears throat> I have uncovered his secret places, and he shall not be able to hide himself. Glory. His seed, <laughs> his seed is spoiled, and his brethren and his neighbors, and he is not. But I have made Esau bear. I have uncovered his secret places. And he shall not be able to hide himself. I know of every underground city that is building. I know of all those satellite luxury homes he's getting ready to set up out there. His seed is spoiled, destroyed. And his brethren and his neighbor and he is not. In other words, he will no longer exist. That's a powerful verse. Go to Isaiah 55 and 7. Book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Most High, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our, our God, for he will abundantly pardon. He will abundantly pardon. Now, when it uses the word here, let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now, when you read that, you must understand that's not speaking about everybody. That's why I left it to the end, because, and that's why I wanted to hurry up to get to this part, because people really say, oh, oh, oh there it is. You said the wicked is Edom. You, you said it's Esau, and the, and the Lord said, hey, they will pardon them. No, no, no. The wicked here is speaking about is our people who became wicked. They became wicked. And I'll prove that in just a moment. I'll, I think I'll run to the... I don't know, let's, let's read it. So he, 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 say, he says here, he says that he, he let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. Only people that can return unto the Lord are the people who were with him in the first place. Israel. And I'm going to jump to the latter clause. says, for he will abundantly pardon. Now, verse 8 says, read for me, please, officer. Eight and verse, nine. Eight. verse 8. <clears throat> for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Most High. Verse 9. For the, uh, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See? So he's, he's letting you know right there that he is in control of what he's doing. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither is my ways your ways, of the Lord. For as the heavens is higher than the earth. So he's letting you know that his people, even though they are in sin right now, he will abundantly pardon them if they will only repent and get back under the statutes, laws, and, and his commandments and begin to follow by faith. Because it's not just the, the, the laws, by the way, and I'm going to be teaching down the road very shortly soon. I'm just making sure we have a good course of this. I'm going to be teaching how you can't do this without faith. Faith is a big part of all of this. Oh, but, but you keep saying the law, the law. Yes, because you have to have the foundation. Everything stands on something. 
Faith needs a foundation. But then we have to deal with faith and how we operate by faith. And many of us are not operating by faith. Faith is key. Without faith, it's impossible to please the Most High God. Let's quickly go, if you please. And again, I'm, I'm rushing a little bit for time. But let's go, if you please, and read. Um, let's go to Obadiah chapter 2 and 7. Obadiah chapter 7 and 2. We need to go to Obadiah. If we're still dealing with Esau, we need, need, need to go to Obadiah. Book of Obadiah, chapter 7, verse 2. Oops. I'm sorry, again, Pastor? Obadiah, chapter uh-huh. 2, verse 7. Oh, I'm sorry. So when I say chapter two, I mean verse two and and, and verse seven. <laughs> okay. My, 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 I'm sorry. I'm 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 pulling you up. I beg your pardon. Obadiah, uh, chapter uh, chapter one, verse two. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Heathen, thou art greatly despised. Greatly despised. Go ahead. Through to, through to seven or seven. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to thy bo- to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have this deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under the, under thee. There is none understanding in him. There's no understanding in him. That's, that's quite self-explanatory. Go, would you please, to Ecclesiastes. Uh, Steve's chapter 3 and 14. Book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 14. I know that whatsoever Yahweh doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put, put to it, nor anything taken from it. And Yahweh doeth it, that men should fear before him. Amen. All right, from there, Second Ezra, chapter six and nine. The Second Ezra, chapter six, verse nine. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of that of it that followeth. Praise ye the Lord. All right. Is there any question that anybody has before I conclude? So, so, Pastor, if you know, in, in in the strictest sense of the word, the everyone, every, every even Abraham on down are still Hebrew. I mean, he's still Hebrew, correct? Yes, he's Hebrew. Yes. Right. So then, that would mean that Esau is Hebrew. Correct. The, the delineation is between Esau and Jacob slash Israel. So would it not right. be more clear or less ambiguous to say Israel or, or Jacob rather than Hebrew? Say that one more time. Would it not be more um, accurate to say Israel yeah, it, yes. mm-hmm. or Jacob instead of Hebrew? Yeah, yeah. Well, the reason why it uses the term Hebrew is because the Most High wanted to make sure that there is a clear understanding that those who are Hebrew does not mean that they are Jacob. Right. There are many that are Hebrew because Abraham was Hebrew, um, Ishmael was Hebrew, and we know that Esau was also Hebrew. But Mm -hmm. what's, what's my point with that? My point with that is this that even though we were dealing with Abraham and dealing with the fact that Abraham had um, Ishmael, according to the scriptures that you find in the New Testament, that Ishmael was the son of the flesh, whereas Isaac was the son of promise. 
And therefore, there is a greater spiritual aspect to Isaac than there is with Ishmael. The blessings, however, of Abraham was upon both his sons. That's why Ishmael, to this very day, are one of the richest people on the planet. They have oil. They have all the oil, in fact. And they are the richest people on the planet in terms of their oil stock. But their kingdom relationship with the Most High God is zero. Whereas Israel, in this case, um, Isaac, Jacob, they are kingdom related. Because what happens as well, one would say, well, then how does Abraham and Isaac get into the kingdom if they're not part of the 12 tribes because they weren't born? Well, that's the beauty of the, of the mind of God. That's why we read the scripture earlier that said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts as the earth is from the heaven. Why is he making that clear? Because what you don't understand at this level, at his level, there is far more clarity of it, meaning that Abraham, Isaac, would have to come back through the bloodline of Jacob to become part of the 12 tribes. So being a part of the 12 tribes, they will enter into the kingdom. Now, not just Abraham, not just Isaac or Isaac, but also going back to Enoch. Methuselah, and all of those individuals of the past, those individuals also, along with Moses, are going to come back through the bloodline of Jacob because it's become the, it becomes the principal kingly bloodline that all of us who return will come through that line to have a right to the tree of life. And that's the beauty of it. Because with that then, it filters out all the others. Because none of, uh, of Ishmael is going to come back through that bloodline. None of, um, of, 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 uh, of uh, Esau is going to come back through that bloodline. Only the children, in fact, of the Bible, I know we read that it says the children of Israel. The truth is, it's, 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 it's um, Banohim, meaning um, Ben, son of Israel. So it's, it's, it's all because it's using the seed, the, the, the seed line. Only the sons are going to come back through that bloodline in order for them to be, have a right to the tree of life in that regard. Right. But, when, but, when, but my point is when you refer to Hebrews, that's a much wider net than when you say Israel. Israel, Exactly. Israel narrows everything down. Right. Because remember, when Yahweh was on earth, some of the people he was ministering to turned around and said, but, but our father is Abraham. Do you remember that? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they said that. They were boasting on that. Uh, but, but yes, you are, but you are, you are of Abraham by way of the flesh, not by way of promise. Is there any other questions out there before I let you all go? No, isn't that funny? Last week when I cut it short a little bit to give you time to (laughs) to ask questions, there was no question, so I came up with it very quickly. Now I went on a little bit, and uh, there's still no questions. All right. That means I must have done a, a fair job then. All right, to all of you out there, um, I hope that this has helped to answer some of the questions uh, as to who is uh, Edom, and I hope some, some things were brought to light, and I pray that you continue to study to show yourself approved. Um, in going now, I, I want to remind some of you that there will be uh, n- no Sabbath uh, meeting on this Sabbath because uh, we will be in, uh, in Dallas, uh, but I pray, ladies and gentlemen, that you give, you um, give us journey mercies by way of your prayers, and we look forward to seeing you again, and we'll see you uh, next week. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.